on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. Everything we do in the wild world is hard and you don't succeed all the time. How many of you listening to this can walk through your neighborhood and name all the plants that live in it? Whenever I get a new ingredient, it seems like I always end up on your website and not intentionally. Yes, I love doing chefy things. However, I get more satisfaction about helping lots of people do little things to help up their game. Making foraging cool to hunters and making hunting cool to foragers, I feel like you have been a kind of a pioneer in that. I don't care where you are on the political spectrum. You can come together over the desire for for good, solid knowledge about wild foods. More people will be connected to the wild world in some aspect, and it will be an echo, but that echo matters. Episode 29 of the Wild Fed Podcast, Hunter, Angler, Gardener, Cook with Hank Shaw, is brought to you by Sir Thrival. Sir Thrival wants to remind you that a resilient immunity is about a lot more than just stimulating your immune system. It's about immunomodulation. In other words, you want an immune system that can adjust based on need, becoming stronger when it's compromised, but also one that can calm itself down when it becomes overactive. Colostrum and medicinal mushrooms are effective immune modulators, helping your body to maintain the immune balance that it needs. In this current pandemic, we're hearing a lot about the cytokine storm, essentially an autoimmune reaction where the body's immune cells begin attacking its own tissues. This is where immune modulators can be so valuable. Keep your immune system strong, but also keep it in balance. Check out the product line at surthrival.com. It's turkey, fiddlehead, and ramp season here in Maine, and you can see myself, my wife Avani, and our friends Arthur and Sarah out hunting and foraging for these iconic species in episode one of the Wild Fed TV show. It's free over at wild-fed.com. If you like what you see, the rest of the season is available there too. It's eight episodes total, and you can also get the director's cuts, which include an additional 14 hours of content. That includes conversations about the episodes themselves, as well as the equipment and tactics we use throughout the show. If you're new to this lifestyle, we made those director's cuts for you with the goal of shortening your learning curve. Lastly, if you aren't following us on Instagram, our handle is at wild.fed, so please give us a follow next time you're scrolling through your Instagram feed. And as I mentioned, it's turkey season here in Maine and in New Hampshire too, and I hunt both states since I live so close to the border. I've had three incredible hunts so far, filling both my Maine tags and one in New Hampshire too. Now I'm tagged out in Maine, but New Hampshire allows me to take one more bird this spring, or I can hang on to that tag till the fall. But with Maine allowing the take of five birds of either sex in the autumn season, I'll probably pursue one more New Hampshire bird this spring. Maybe we'll do an episode actually talking about those hunts, but I just want to say I think the gobble call is the most underutilized tool in the turkey hunter's arsenal. There's a lot of emphasis on hen calls, diaphragm mouth calls, slate calls, box calls. They're all designed to imitate a receptive hen turkey, and this works great when it works. But being able to imitate a rival Tom or Jake can make the difference between a successful hunt and a bowl of tag soup. Now this year, two out of my three Toms were harvested using a gobble call. So take from that what you will, but I just wanted to mention it. It's also wild leek season. So Avani and I recently set out for our annual harvest, and we've been eating leeks daily for the last week. Big thanks to my friend Justin for sharing his leek spot with us. We live toward the northeasternmost part of the geographic range of the wild leek plants, so there aren't too many occurrences up here. That makes new spots that much more important, so thanks so much, Justin. We also went canoeing yesterday for our ostrich fern fiddleheads and enjoyed the year's first meal of those last night. It's such a wonderful and hearty wild vegetable, and it's a flavor I really associate with this time of the year. Now, a bit later this month, we'll get out to Dipnet Alewives. That's an anadromous species of herring. They run up the rivers from the sea to get into ponds and lakes, still water, where they breed. Then we'll be shifting our focus from inland waters to the coast, where I'll start heading offshore to pursue haddock, pollock, and other ground fish. That's what I really like to put up in the freezer for the winter. Now, as I've mentioned in the last few episodes, I'm a bit concerned about the economic fallout from these really extreme shutdown measures that were put in place in response to this virus. I think it's a good idea to go into this upcoming winter with your pantries and freezers really well stocked. Hopefully, we'll see our supply chains rebound quickly and our society begin to return to some sense of social normalcy. 
But these are really uncertain times. So while I work hard every year to fill my freezers, I'll have a bit more urgency this season as we move from the summer into the autumn months. I've already put up eight gallons of maple syrup, a couple quarts of birch syrup. I've got three turkeys broken down and frozen, several jars of my homemade leek preserve tucked away, and I'll get my fiddleheads pickled soon too. So I'll be taking that kind of an approach all year, as well as rounding it all out with produce from our local farm and the staples we supplement with from our grocery store. I hope you're thinking about all of this too, whatever that looks like for you. More than anything, I hope this podcast and the Wild Fed TV show have inspired you to get after it a bit more this year. As I've said dozens of times on this show and others, you can start with just one species. Find someone to show you. Use a guidebook. Take a foraging class or a plant walk. Get to a hunter safety class. Go out on a fishing charter. And if you're already hunting, fishing, and foraging, I want to challenge you to broaden your approach. Add a plant or an animal to your repertoire this season. Some species are perfect for the freezer or the can, but others are great for just a single fresh meal. The more species you know, the more anti-fragile you are as a person, and the deeper your relationship with the natural world will be. And the more you have to look forward to with each changing season. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The Wild Fed Podcast, a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed food is all around you. Well, today's interview is with one of my heroes in the world of wild food. That's Hank Shaw. He's a chef, author, and outdoorsman who runs the wild food website, Hunter, Angler, Gardener, Cook. He's the author of four books, Hunt, Gather, Cook, Duck, Duck, Goose, Buck, Buck, Moose, and Pheasant, Quail, Cottontail, all wild game cookbooks. If you're like me, you find yourself on his website a lot too. Now, he's probably one of the most authoritative voices on wild food cookery, at least in our generation, and he's inspired a lot of us who promote hunting, fishing, foraging, and of course, cooking with the ingredients we harvest. With COVID driving me to do more remote episodes, I thought it'd be a great time to reach out to Hank to learn a bit more about what drives him as a person to produce so much work in the wild food space. It was great to ask him about how he sees his own contribution to our community to get a sense of how his mind works and where he's taking all his projects in the future. He's got a really grounded but inspiring approach to wild foods. If you haven't already, I hope this podcast will encourage you to add his books to your library and his podcast to your subscription list. Hank is leaving a legacy in the wild food space, and we all owe him a debt of gratitude for his rich body of work. Just don't let Hank catch you grinding a shank. Hank Shaw, thanks so much for uh, being on the show today. Thanks for having me on. Man, I've wanted to talk to you for a long time now. I'm a big fan and um, did not expect that it would happen, you know, during a pandemic or because of one. Most of my shows have been recorded in person, but we've uh, taken to the online environment. So I get to talk to you. So thanks for taking some time out of your busy quarantine for us. It is surprisingly busy, you know, because I work from home as it is and half of my business life is sitting in front of a computer screen that hasn't changed but we've had a bunch of restrictions in what we can do in the outdoor world which has been kind of sucky but um we're starting to see that lift a little bit and so i'm hopeful for a late spring and for people listening just uh in the future let's give them a reference point today is april 29th of 2020 so uh if you're wondering where we are in the saga of the covid19 pandemic uh that's where we are we're just kind of coming to that point where states are starting to begin initial Uh, lifting of some of the um, social distancing stuff. But um, yeah, I want to ask about what it's like in California. We're about to go into our turkey season here. And uh, you guys have been in your turkey season for a little while, but are you guys allowed to hunt up there? We were. uh, Our turkey season ends this weekend, I believe. And and they've, uh, you know, they've allowed turkey season to go on as normal. And I didn't get a chance to go out, but uh, a lot of people I know I've done really well this year. It was Washington that didn't really allow people to hunt at all. And they yeah. just lifted that yesterday. Oh, they did. I wonder if that was like intentional or like kind of an oversight, you know, or, you know, people who don't necessarily understand the culture of it or something. I can't imagine that's like intentionally draconian, but any thoughts about all of that? My thought is that it was not intentional to include hunting, but it was intentional to stop fishing. And so they just said, oh, fishing and hunting, it's, it, it's all of a piece so we're going to stop it all for for social distancing, and and the reason why is you you've seen this all over the country, is you know okay everybody's at home, people lost their jobs, you know so there's more people who are fishing for 
personal consumption, you know, to feed their mm-hmm. families. And so what was happening is that uh, boat ramps were getting super, super crowded. Uh, tested, yeah. And I don't know if you've ever seen like a Michigan boat ramp in walleye <laughs> season, but I mean, it, you can, I mean, hundreds of vehicles and rigs. Right. And okay. so even though, you know, I mean, I've been at boat ramps my whole life and you could easily social distance even in a crowd and in at a boat ramp, but that's why they, they put it down. And the other thing that goes on is that, especially once you get a little bit later in the year, and we're going to probably see restrictions on this too, is uh, combat fishing. So in the salmon run, um, there will be mm. people shoulder to shoulder to shoulder fishing the rivers in the Pacific Northwest. And I can't imagine they're going to allow that. Right, right. Oh, that's really interesting. You know, here in Maine, we have, um, well, a couple interesting things happen. And I think it's fascinating to see what happens when you decentralize control and give it to the governors, because each governor's got their own um, personality and, and agenda and whatnot. Here in Maine, they uh, are allowing fishing without a license all through April. And they're allowing you to uh, use your boat unregistered. And the other thing that's really interesting is they're letting us, normally we treat turkeys like big games. So, you know, you put your transportation tag on the bird, bring it to the tagging station, and then they give you the state tag that they put on the bird. This year, they're not having you do any registration at all. So there won't be any way to count birds that are harvested. It's just um, go ahead and hunt and no need to register. There's no online registration or anything like that in the state. So it'd be really interesting to see, you know, (laughs) kind of like how that plays out. But they've been telling folks fishing, um, stay one rod's length away from your fishing partner, which I thought was kind of cute. That makes sense. Uh, so you know, a typical rod is six feet long. So there you go. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Right. Um, anyway, I, I fish a lot of Tenkara rods, which means like more like 14 feet, but, um, okay. So backing up a little bit, um, of course I, I know you from your cookbooks. Um, but also I think even more impactful to me has been as a forager, hunter, fisher, cook, um, whenever I get a new ingredient that I haven't really worked with before and I get online and start digging around, it seems like I always end up on your website and not intentionally, you know, it's just like you've written something on it and usually something pretty extensive. Uh, so first I wanted to say thank you because it's been an incredible service that you've done for folks um, who are into wild foods. And I'd just love to get a little backstory about the website and how you kind of came to be there. I know you have a background as a political reporter, uh, which is really kind of fascinating, the transition. So I wonder if you could kind of bring us up to speed on how you've ended up uh, where you are today. So I started Hunter, Angler, Gardener, Cook uh, in 2007. So it's been going on for quite a while. Wow. And I've been doing it full time since 2010. And we're in, in fact, April of 2010. So it's officially 10 years. Congratulations. Um, Thank you. I've never missed a mortgage payment so far, which I'm pretty (laughs) pretty happy to be able to say. Yeah. Um, You know, I mean, I didn't start hunting as a kid. I started started hunting as an adult, but I started fishing and foraging as a as a little kid. So I had kind of two legs of the stool from the get-go. And, you know, picking wild plants and digging clams and berries and things. That's part of my family's DNA. It's always been a little piece of what made our family our family. And fishing as well. My mom is from the Gloucester, Massachusetts area. Ah, and she's from I- Ipswich. I mean, commercial know Ipswich. Fi- yeah, of course. Com- yeah. That's like commercial fishing capital of the world for folks who don't realize. I mean, or for the U.S., I mean, that's that's uh, really an important port. Yeah, Gloucester, New Bedford, and, and Dutch Harbor are the three big ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, fishing has been extremely important to all of us forever. And so I've been fishing since like probably before I could walk, but it's certainly as long as I've been able to walk. And I've over the years been able to fish or hunt or forage 48 of the 50 states. I'm missing Hawaii and West Virginia. Oh, no kidding. When are you going? Uh, I don't have immediate plans for it given the, the, <laughs> yeah, exactly. the, dread, the dread disease, but at some point, yeah, I mean, I've been yeah. to all, I've been 49. I need to go to Hawaii to finish my 50 out, but that's a pretty cool one to, to leave for the end. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, you know, and it's funny because I live in California. So everyone is going to be like, what? There's direct flights. I'm like, yeah, I just <laughs> needed yeah, to leave right now too. Yeah. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, if you look out a little ways. So, what what was that you were doing before? Like, um, you, I know you were doing political reporting, but oh, sorry, I'll let you actually catch up. I think I kind of jumped ahead of you there. Go ahead. 
Well, I was a uh, I was a newspaper reporter for about eighteen years, and at the beginning of that career, I was also a restaurant cook. So I started as a as a you know I actually started as a dishwasher, and then the inevitable happened: the, the sous chef failed to show up, and so I got immediately promoted to dishwasher and sous chef, and then they hired another dishwasher because I could actually cook, and I did that for quite a while, and then I dropped that. Uh, to be when I just I got better newspaper jobs, so I ended up leaving the professional kitchen. They're very very similar jobs if you break it down. It's it's surprising how similar the newsroom and the professional kitchen are. They're both staffed by misfits. They both have <laughs> weird hours. They're both um, environments where you tend to drink a lot, and they're also both professions where it's a calling more than it is just a job. Mm -hmm. If your if your chef just thinks it's a job, your food will suck. If your chef loves his or her job, then your food will be good. And it's very similar with a newspaper reporter. And it's just we don't do those jobs for the money. You do it because you feel called to it. And so I did both of those jobs off and on for 18 years before I started doing this full time. And this has kind of been an interesting sum of a lot of choices. Um, you know, I went to graduate school for history. I, you know, I wrote on deadline for almost two decades, and I was uh, okay. In I was a wondering you, you write a lot, obviously, for your website and then your books. And I was wondering if you know where that you developed the discipline for that. Yeah, I don't think I can't remember any time I've had writer's block, just <laughs> yeah, because yeah. you can't. It's, you know, you can't have writer's block as a newspaper reporter because the deadline is in two hours. Mm -hmm. So you better damn well write. What on that when people say they have writer's block? And, you know, you know, as a writer, what would you kind of offer to folks who either think they have that or um, just sort of thoughts about, you know, being around writers? You know, uh, how, what's your method? Just start writing. Yeah. You know, just, just, just start writing. And even if what you have created is what we call a vomit draft, <laughs> there will be nuggets in there that can be reworked. And what often happens is there's a, a throat clearing process on a page where you're writing and you're writing and you're writing and you're just like blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden kind of starts to take form and that might be 12 paragraphs in, but there it is. And then the stuff that's above paragraph 12 either is useless or it can be reworked later in the, right. in the piece. And when you were writing specifically, like what was your angle and what part of politics were you involved in? I mostly covered state legislatures and governors, although yeah. I did cover Congress for a little bit. Okay, because that kind of leads me to, obviously we're going to talk about wild foods, but I think this is a really interesting moment in history and folks are having to interpret news. And I don't know if I've ever in my lifetime seen where news and politics had t had become so polarized and so biased. So right now, as we try to sort through looking for um, accurate data on this illness and this virus, uh, we're having to sort through, you know, partisan politics because there's a lot more going on in nearly everything I read than just what's there at face value, right? So uh, I'm kind of curious how you see things right now from the perspective of having worked in the news industry. So if you were to look at CNN, if you were to look at Fox, if you were to look at, um, you know, the coronavirus task force, or you were to look at what's coming out of WHO, all that, you know, how are you interpreting that and where do you go for your news? Well, one of the things that's interesting, and it's one of the reasons why I got out of politics is the polarization of, of the media sources. And it's, it is pretty much overblown. And here's, here's why. So if you watch Fox News and you watch the reporters from Fox News, they're legit reporters. Right. If yeah. you watch the reporters from CNN, they're legit reporters. Where you see the tilting of the scale are the non-reporters. So because both of those networks have to be on the air for 24-7, 365, they have to fill airtime. And so it takes time and money and effort to do a job as a reporter. And so those individuals can't be on camera very often because it's, you know, they're working, you know, they're doing their thing. 
and then they will come up and this, this is my report and I'm, and I'm reading my report. Here's some video, blah, blah, blah. So if you look at the reporters themselves, they're doing a pretty good job. It's the commentators where people get angry. And the problem is media literacy. So the vast majority of people consuming broadcast news don't know that Sean Hannity is not a newspaper reporter. <laughs> right. <laughs> he's not a reporter. Really? He's just he's just a guy talking. Yeah. And and you know, you may agree with him or not. And it doesn't really matter because but he's just all he is, he's a consumer of news just like you are. Can he's we give a man. balance to him? Just let's give a balance to him just so we're being fair here. I don't I don't know. I mean I don't really watch TV <laughs> at all. Yeah, so maybe Rachel other other Maddow? Yeah. yeah, thank you. I think that works great. Rachel actually. Maddow maybe? I mean Perfect. it's just like because I just don't really watch. Right, of course. I don't really watch broadcast news. Right. Like on election night, here's the thing. So if you watch on election night and you watch just the reporters, um, who's the, there's a, there's a, a white haired guy who's always on the magic map at CNN. That guy's a really good reporter, but he's the only reporter on the stage on election night at CNN. Everybody else is just a talking head. Mm -hmm. So Wolf the problem. No, no, it's not Wolf. It's uh, I think his name is King maybe. Okay. Um, yeah, he's a he's he's just recently got in, uh, got gray hair, but he's the guy who runs that magic map. Um, anyway, so that's the thing. Like, if you know what you're looking at, you know it's not that bad. It's kind of right. overblown. Like, if you really look at at you know print media, there is a institutional bias, and what I mean by that is that when you are covering politics from any given angle, you're you've developed a lot of it, knowledge and expertise about whatever the institution is that you're covering. So you're going to be biased towards the preservation of that institution. So it doesn't necessarily, most reporters aren't blatantly left or blatantly right, but most reporters hold the institution that they are covering in very high regard as an institution. So not necessarily the people who are running it, but, you know, let's just say the legislature, you know, that the legislature is a worthy thing and should be maintained, right? So you will see what you call an institutional bias of like, oh, well, that's why the, with the current administration where they have broken a lot of norms, you've seen a lot of pushback from the media and it's less so about left and right and more so about institutional and not institutional, okay. if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. It does. Yeah, so watching this, um, just curious, like uh, how you feel about having covered uh, governors, you know, in the past and state legislatures and such. Like, how do you feel about California's approach at present? Uh, you know, I'm not a huge fan of the current governor, but I have to say, he's not doing a terrible job. Curious too, like we, with the impacts of COVID, you're able to be out side if you want to be foraging you want to be hunting you you can do that i mean I, we're hearing on the east coast i just keep hearing stories about people being arrested in california for you know paddle boarding and things like that so um you know it's friendly to you being out in nature i think it's benign neglect um mm -hmm. the focus of the authorities right now are to keep crowds from forming and what I do is inherently either solo or it'll be me and Holly. So it just be, it's, it's inherently social distancing. And yeah. so the prop, you know, the, 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 the practice of foraging, um, is, you know, it's solitary for the most part. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, so what? Nobody cares about that, especially in a, in a state of 38 million people. Yeah. Um, what we're starting to see is that it looks like knock on wood, that we're going to be able to go out on on uh, charter boats soon. With, oh, great! Um, great with face masks and with reduced loads, so that people can stay, you know, that that rod distance away from each other. You fishing like head boats, uh, or you 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 actually hiring out boats? Both. Yeah, I live too far from the salt water to really own my own boat. It doesn't make any sense for me. I have a twenty foot boat, <clears throat> which you know I fish inshore with, but I usually take a party boat offshore. And this is the time of year where I start you know, catching Pollock and, and Haddock and start filling up the freezer with fillets, but you know, our boat's not running. And, uh, it looks like we, the charter boats aren't included till the third phase of Maine's opening. So guides are able to function now, uh, or starting on the first of May, but, uh, the party boats won't be able to go out. So I'm kind of scrambling, trying to figure out how I replace that food source because it's become, you know, it's two or three meals uh, a week all year that we eat from, you know, just from ground fishing. 
than I do off the coast here. So anyway, I'm glad to hear you guys will be able to get back out. Um, are you, you know, are you seeing impacts as far as like your ability to fill your freezer or your ability to, to kind of do what you do? Is it been impacted by this at all? Or, or are you finding, cause you mentioned before, and I would really agree, I work from home, so it's barely impacted me. I mean, hearing about so many people being out of work and all, you know, seeing these impacts to the economy and to businesses. But for me and my team, it's been work as usual. Uh, we haven't really, in fact, I'd say sometimes I'm working more, you know, because I'm, I'm home in front of my computer. So, um, and when we go out to fish and forage, aside from that fishing trip, everything's basically the same. So, you know, my hobbies are the same and my work's the same. So, um, are you having any diminishment in, you know, your ability to actually get the foods that you work with? Not yet. Good. <laughs> so what's interesting is that two things are happening. One, Holly and I are skilled at, at what we do. So during hunting season, especially during duck season, we do a lot of laying off because like, uh, you know, we know how many ducks and geese we're going to eat in a year. We know what the possession limit is. So we go, we, you know, we shoot for a possession limit by the end of the season. So that it's three days worth of, worth of birds. Okay. So what we had, and then, you know, there's turkey season, there's javelinas and there's fish and then there's venison and then there's done. You have javelina in Northern California? No, 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 no. But I, I spent a lot of time in Texas. Oh, okay. Got and, it. uh, and I spent a lot of time in Arizona and both of those have. Javelina. Where do you like in Arizona? Uh, everywhere. It's a great state. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> I, I just got back actually. Um, but what I'm finding is that the fact that I'm now cooking more or less every meal, right. uh, what we do is we, we spend two meals a, a, a week to support our local restaurants, which if you are listening to this and you have the ability to do that, is extremely important to pick a restaurant or maybe two or three that you can continue to support during this so that mm -hmm. you can keep them alive. That's that's as good as that's a good as uh, that's almost as good as charity if you in my mind. Yeah. yeah that's excellent advice. But the rest of it is I'm cooking from it twice a day often and I'm finally getting to eat down the reserves so that when we get into the next hunting season uh, uh we won't have the problem of uh the freezer's kind of full. <laughs> yeah. And and yeah. I'll tell you what I do not I will not buy a bigger freezer just to fill it because there's only so much that the two of us can eat every year. So why hunt or fish beyond what you need? I mean, yes, we do give some to friends, but there's a limit to that too. So I find that you, you know, your family, whatever size your family is, or if you're an individual or whatever, you know what you're going to eat every year. And, and so you kind of have to have that in the back of your head as you're going through your, the rhythm of your year. Like, yeah, maybe I don't need to go hunt ducks today, or maybe I don't need mm -hmm. another freezer full of fish, you know? So the cool thing about this is that I'm, uh, in fact, uh, um, I just wrote a piece that will appear on the website soon called freezer debris. And it's <laughs> about those random things that like lurk in the, darkest corners of your box freezer and well yeah. what do you do with it and so it's it's a little bit about freezer burn meat but it's also about bits and baubles and what do you do with like a tongue or you know four goose livers or something like that and and <laughs> it's made me more creative and the i've started meal planning which is something i've never done because i'm a i'm a go to the supermarket almost every day kind of guy and now you're not supposed to do that so i don't and I'm thinking, all right, well, I'm going to make a nice dinner because we're, we're running the website same as normal, just like you are. And so we've got dishes that are ready for photography and are ready for prime time. And then there's others that are test kitchen. You know, so like I don't make everything perfect the first time, contrary to what some people believe. And then you got those leftovers. Like we had a, I did a filling of chorizo and potatoes for uh, Oaxacan molotes, which is a, it's like a torpedo shaped bit of awesomeness. It's like a, it's like this chorizo and potato filling surrounded by a masa torpedo, basically. Did I see that on your, that's on your Instagram right now? Yes. 
Yes, okay. it is. Mm -hmm. And so I haven't quite nailed it yet. So it's not on the website yet. It's in the test kitchen stage. So one of the issues is that the filling was nice, uh, but it wasn't amazing. And I, I want every recipe on my site to be heavily tested and heavily amazing, right? So um, we had this filling left over. So well, what did I do? I just decided to <laughs> take the leftover filling and form it into patties, coat it in masa, and fry that for lunch the next day. So yeah. this kind of repurposing and and clever use of leftovers and this is all kind of a plus side of this whole deal that we're in yeah i feel like it's also really highlighting um benefits of this lifestyle that had kind of gotten pushed to the back because they didn't seem as important um some of those things have to do with just being outside and having something to go out and do. Some of them have to do with, you know, I'm sure you're seeing a lot of headlines about um, meat processing plants being down and hogs being euthanized. I'm hearing a lot of reports about, um, you know, them not hatching chicks for um, large scale chicken operations and things like that. So, you know, there's the potential for probably uh, increased you know, meat prices, but potentially even some shortages here and there too. Uh, so a lot of those things are being highlighted too. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that. Are you experiencing a lot of people coming to you going like, ah, I get it now, or, Hey, I really want to learn how to do this stuff finally, or those kind of things. Well, I run a forum on Facebook called the hunt gather cook forum, and I am seeing unprecedented requests to be a, a member of this. It's a private group, so you have to <laughs> yeah. answer questions to get in. So like I'm I'm seeing tons of people asking to be part of the group. And I'm seeing tons of those questions in that. But there's a converse side to this meat supply thing is I know two uh very small scale hog farmers, one in Michigan, one in Ohio. And they have unprecedented demand. Like they're making they're making more money than they've ever had because they're, the demand on their products is so high since this that they're rationing, like my friends in Michigan are rationing the amount of sausages that they're allowing their customers to buy so that they can, mm. they can't keep up with it. And right, right. so it's funny because, and it's all farm pickup, like you drive in and then and you, and you drive off with your, with your goods. So there's this, I've all, yeah. And yet I've also seen things like from Dan Barber, he's a chef in upstate New York. Um, talking about how this could really, really hurt small scale farmers. And I don't know what to necessarily make of that part of it because I've, my personal experience are any small scale livestock or, or regular truck farm that is geared to dealing with a consumer is doing an amazing job. Yeah. What was but his rationale that were, in saying that? Oh, because. A lot of these small scale high end farmers are, uh, they depend on restaurant trade and the restaurants oh, are right, all closed. Right. But they must be seeing increased foot traffic at their farm stands or um, in their CSAs and things like that. I mean, the, when this started, the very first thing I did um, was join a CSA at a farm, the farm that I work with to get, you know, a lot of our produce anyway. But I wanted to buy in early, one, to, to support her, but also because of, you know, I want to just know that I have a share set aside for me. So I got to imagine that like you're saying that they're experiencing um, growth and they're able oh, yeah. to work, you know? The, the, the I just got off the phone with my uh, with a woman in Indiana who I buy chili peppers from, like the started plants. And she's she could barely keep up. And other seed companies are, are two weeks, three weeks behind in their orders because there's the demand for seeds and started plants are through the roof. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, you know, at the risk of minimizing sort of the epidemic, um, which is not what I'm intending to do here, but when I look for those silver linings, one of them is that a lot of the um, goals that so many of us have shared over the years is particularly this idea of kind of decentralizing the food supply a little bit and having that renaissance of small scale production, uh, promoting hunting, fishing, foraging, all those kind of things. I feel like, and I'd love your opinion if you think this is what's going to happen, but it seems like this is going to lead to a real renaissance around that. I mean, maybe to the point, one of the things that's come up for me, I'd love your, we can kind of go to this later, but you know, the fact that foraging remains a, a very unregulated activity, um, in some ways I'm really grateful for that. In some ways that concerns me. Um, I'm wondering kind of like if there's going to be so much onboarding right now, if it's going to force folks to have to look at this a little bit differently, um, because, you know, suddenly 
this goes from maybe some people, you know, I imagine you got the folks who already do it. We're going to keep doing it. The folks who've dabbled in it are probably going to want to do it more. And then like you're saying or experiencing anecdotally um, on your Facebook group, you have a lot of new people coming in. It's kind of like uh, the gun shops are saying that, right? Like suddenly they're, they have firearm purchases primarily from first time buyers. People who don't have any experience with firearms are coming in to buy firearms for the first time. Uh, so I'd imagine we're going to get a lot of that coming into the culture. i um, just curious how you kind of see this all playing out um, from a wild food perspective or from from your perspective, which I would say is kind of like, I mean, you're definitely amongst the leading voices in, in wild foods and probably the leading voice when it comes to integrating all of these different disciplines of hunting, fishing, foraging, gardening, all of that, like you're kind of are the voice. So from, from your position, you know, how do you see this playing out in the longer term as it relates to wild foods? I think number one, it's not going to be as big as you think. Um, everything we do in the wild world is hard and you don't succeed all the time. And there are too many people out there who are like, that's a great idea. Let's do that. And then they try and then they fail and they try and they fail. And then, and then they're like, Oh, I can't wait to go back to the supermarket. And <laughs> yeah. you know, you're going to see a lot of that, a ton of that, that of said, and I, I can't quantify it, but the, there will be a core of people who here's, here's a good example. So do you remember when you started canning things? Mm-hmm. Sure do. So when you when anybody typical person starts canning things, they're going to can everything, and they're going to can like fifty gallons of peaches because they can, and they're going to realize very soon that there's no way on God's green acre that they're going to be able to eat fifty gallons of freaking peaches. They may eat five gallons of peaches. So like they there's this they they'll figure it out. They'll get equilibrium, and and I think what you will see long term after this period ends. And this is this is my hope, and it's an educated guess because I've seen it before. Is an additional number of people who have made something connected to the wild food world part of their family's DNA. Yeah. So you'll find somebody will do try ten different things, but they're like, you know what? I really loved picking asparagus, or I really loved hunting turkeys, or I really loved catching haddock or sheep's head or something. So you will find at, when this is all said and done years from now that more people will be connected to the wild world in some aspect because of this. And it will be, it will be a, an echo, but that echo matters. I, I really agree. I think it matters a lot. I mean, there's so, in so many different ways. And, and sometimes I think about, how important it is to that the practices around you know harvesting and processing wild food and cooking wild food sometimes i think about it like a museum thing like you know each one of us is curating something and it's really important because we just don't want this to go away or be forgotten or kind of slip through our fingers and so it's important that there are people who have, even if it's just one thing that they do um, it's like so important that they have that also because it gives their family or them personally a connection to nature, which really Im impacts how they see the world. So anyway, I think that's really important. And, and to your point, I feel like I'm going to have a lot of competition over ostrich fern fiddleheads in the next week or two, because it's very popular here in Maine and people already know about it. And a lot of people don't do it anymore, but they're probably going to pick it back up this year. And, uh, but I'm not really worried about our leak spots, our ramps, because not a lot of people here know about them. I'm concerned about my blueberry spot this year. I'm not so worried about cranberries. Not many people do it, but a lot of people know about it, right? So there's like, there's those species that some people already have some kind of tether to, you know, they're real common raspberries, blackberries, you know, apples, morels. things like that. Yeah. Yeah. For you guys out there, morels, exactly. So I would imagine that there's going to be some uptick in that probably for at least for a year, you know, at least for this this season. Um, but like you said, how much of that remains. So I want to get back. So I had started, I kind of took us off track. I was asking about your, um, you know, your work doing political reporting. Tell us about the transition that you made to doing what you do today. So the reason I started Hunter Angler Gardener Cook 13 years ago now was most people listening to this are good at something that they don't necessarily love. So often it's a job. And in my case, it was a job. 
So I got into politics because I was excited about the diversity of regional people and ethnicities and political backgrounds all under one roof competing for scarce resources. So the when I started doing that job, it was inherently about compromise and debate. And as we all know, that has largely fallen away into polarized sides shouting past each other. And that I don't, it doesn't really matter what your politics are. That's inherently boring. So if all you're reporting about is like side A saying you're a poopy head and side B saying you're a poopy head, like, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm checking out. So because I had for years fished and, and picked wild plants, mushrooms and things, just to keep myself sane, you know, I mean, it's kind of a rough and tumble job that I was in. Mm-hmm. I started thinking, you know, hey, there was this guy named Johnny Apple. And Johnny Apple was a New York Times reporter back in the 70s. I'm sure he was spanned from the 60s to the 80s, but the 70s was kind of when he hit his heyday. And he was a big time political reporter for the New York Times. And then ultimately, probably, I never got to meet him, had the same kind of realization that I had, like, man, what the heck with this shit. Um, and he started writing about food for the New York Times. And he became an excellent food reporter for the New York Times. And I'm like, ah, you know what? I could be the poor man's Johnny Apple. And so I started doing or, magazine. Poor man's because of foraging and you're sort of joking about the way that you were. No, hard. because I didn't work for the New York Times, man. Like, oh, like I got you. <laughs> All right. I want, to cl- <laughs> I want to clarify that. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Um, no, I would work for much smaller papers. But I, so I started writing magazine articles and I very quickly realized that I had too many ideas in my head to, I would never be able to sell that many magazine articles in it. And I got in at the last few years of when you could make a living as a freelance magazine writer. And that was already fading by the time I got my legs underneath under me as a, as a freelancer. So I started the website and it was a depository for all of the things that I was interested in. And like any website, it had its growing pains. You know, I used to cover, I used to do wine reviews because I, I've been making my own wine forever and I'm a connoisseur of wine and I like wine. And so I was writing reviews about that and that didn't last very long. And, um, you know, I did, I used to do a lot more gardening stuff. And then I realized that I'm a good gardener, you know, I'm better than some and not as good as others. And, but I realized that there's so many people doing gardening things and there were so many people doing gardening things that were better than me. Right. That I kind of right. faded away from that a little bit. I, I mean, I'm still, I have a, I had a garden every year for, I don't know how many years, um, decades. And I'm pretty good at it. However, um, foraging at the time was a complete void. Like, sure, Steve Brill was around. Um, this was before even Sam Thayer was around. And Sam Thayer's kind of a legend. And what uh, are we talking about? We're talking about the like the mid two thousands. This is before his okay. books came out. So obviously okay. he was doing his thing, but it's before his books came right, out. Right, right, right. Uh, but so it was me. It was it was Steve Brill. It was you know. And then there were some really good um, scientists who were doing things like Nancy Turner up in Canada. It was kind of amazing. Um, and then there was you know there's just the the number of voices out there, and and all of us were were drinking from the fountain of Yule Gibbons. And that became an avenue of where I could add something to the conversation. And that's really what anybody in this business I would hope would want to do is, is to add something to the human body of knowledge. I mean, that's why I started this website and why I started the, the Facebook groups and why I write the cookbooks is to, is to add my two cents in on things that I've worked very hard to be good at is so that someday when there's somebody younger and faster and better than me, then, then they'll have my shoulders to stand on. And mm-hmm. that's just the way it works. Yeah. That's what I was trying to say before is I, you know, I see that you've advanced the ball down the court quite a bit, you know, or, or you were talking about Ewell Gibbons who, you know, I don't know a lot about what wild foods were like during his generation, but he's the name and he, he's the author that I know from that era. And he carried the torch then. When you picked it up and you started to have some success writing, like what did you see was your, the two cents you had to add? Like, how do you, 
how do you sort of um, see your contribution? Obviously, you know, I, I, am I correct in saying your website's won a James Beard Award, right? It has. Yeah. So obviously your contribution's been <laughs> more than seen by other folks, but how do you personally view your take um, on wild food culture and what you bring to it? There's a few things that I can kind of hang my hat on. One, I am one of the first to have elevated wild foods to a kind of white linen level. There are lots of people doing it now, but I really, really, really decided that on early on that because of my own background, um, I wanted to show possibilities of what wild foods, not just plants and mushrooms, but, but game and fish as well, what they could do in a, an elevated setting. Now that's not all I do, but that's, it's when I do those dishes, I, I get a lot of personal satisfaction out of them. So that's something that I've done forever that has now become part of the conversation. I, there are other simpler things that I find just as satisfying, if not more. And I'm probably the first guy to yell at people for grinding their shanks. And because I've been doing that for forever and, you know, like forever. And, and so now everybody, every wild game it's chef out there is <laughs> say the same thing, you know, don't yeah. grind your shanks. And it's like, that's something I can, I can add. That's mine. Um, Another one is I have a very particular way of cooking a duck breast that has become part of the conversation. Can we talk about that? And Sure. Tell me about it. So Holly and I hunt lots and lots and lots of ducks and geese. So I've had, <laughs> I've had my 10,000 hours cooking duck breasts. And so this, we're talking about skin on uh, wild or domestic birds. And I've worked with so many of them that I can walk you through any given variable because I've been there. It's like the, that, of that insurance commercial. It's like, yeah, we've seen it. And <laughs> so the, I can, I, I, because I have that kind of deep knowledge, not only can I help somebody with a specific question, like, oh, you shot a wood duck in South Carolina in December. Okay. It's probably going to pre be a pretty fat bird. So here's how you do that. Oh, I caught a migrating, I got a migrating mallard in North Dakota. Like, okay, that bird's probably going to be skinny. You're going to cook it slightly differently. Um, you know, I, I, I got a I resident shot bird a, behind the dump. <laughs> right. You know, I shot a brant. Well, which coast was it on? Was it a, a Atlantic brant or was it a Pacific brant? Because it matters. So, and then the mechanics of that is that you always cook the, the duck breast two thirds to three quarters of the time on the skin side. For a number of reasons that involve physics and, and such, like not the least of which is that fat is an insulator and, mm -hmm. and it takes longer for that fat side to get crispy and for fat to render out. And, you know, the whole cross hatching thing that you see in the chef world, it really is only a factor of morbidly obese birds. Mm -hmm. So um, there's zero reason to do that on any wild bird because the, the problem with cross hatching is that it releases too much fat too soon. And unless it's, super, super fat. It's, you're defeating your own purpose. Um, it does look kind of cool. So I get that, but there's little pieces like, you know, the, how, how hot is your pot as your pan it depends on the size. So if you're cooking teal, you want the, the heat three quarters of the way up. If you're cooking a goose, you want it three quarters of the way down and somewhere in between that. And then there's the final step of, if you can imagine a duck breast, you've got on the length, on the long sides of a duck breast, you know, you've got the, the fat end and the skinny end on the top, front and the back. And then you've got a fat end and a skinny end on the top and the bottom. So the fat end on the bottom is where the breast met kind of the waist of the bird. So it has a fat pocket, kind of like a, like a muffin top on that side of that breast. So the final act of tipping a pair of duck breasts on their sides to sear that fat pad no one has ever done before like it's never I, I mean i'm sure somebody's done it but i've never seen anyone do it i've never heard of anyone doing it i've never and now you see it all the time and that's kind of a cool one um doves yeah. a la mancha has become a thing like it's a particular dove dish that i do so so what is that what is are, that dish describe that dish 
that's easy. So that's a, you pluck you pluck your doves, which by the way, like yes, pluck your doves. So the easiest mm-hmm. thing on the planet to pluck, and they look cool. Um, and you just you coat it in bacon fat, stuff it with a lot of fresh herbs, and then grill it, and then dust it with smoked paprika on the end of it. It's that mm-hmm. simple, but it's amazing. And I guess this is a long winded way of saying that um, yes, I love doing chefy things. However. I get more satisfaction about helping lots of people do little things to help up their game. Yeah, that, I feel like you're like I said before, your website's been a huge um, <clears throat> resource for me. You know, I can just think this year I started hunting sea ducks for I'd never done that before, and wow, do I really enjoy it? And uh, you know. You're, I had to go to your site to just like, what do I do with this thing? Everybody's telling me not to eat it. <laughs> you know, everybody's telling me not to eat them. So kind of working through your material there. Another one would be um, bracken fern, which we're going to be harvesting soon here. You know, and I thought you did such a great job of, you know, sort of laying that out. Because as you know, before, especially before Sam Thayer's books, a lot of times you just read something and it wouldn't really describe what you're supposed to do. You know, like, so anyway, that's been... a huge deal. I mean, I have to say that Sam and I probably influence each other on that. But so my background as a newspaper reporter and as a, as a PhD student in history, that allows me, that has given me the ability and the, the critical eye to read science and I can read scientific papers and I read a lot of them. And that's another thing. Like I've been called the Alton Brown of wild food and, mm-hmm. and I'm super flattered by that. Um, I wish I could live up to his, his standards, but, but yes, that's, you know, bringing real science, like the the whole thing about deer fat. I wrote a whole piece about why deer fat isn't, isn't the devil. Um, you know, why snow geese are, are delicious that, cause there's, there's a lot of data that's out there that can help anybody who is skeptical because there's so much, especially about hunting, fishing as well. Hunting and fishing has so much hearsay and so much, uh, it's not really wives' tales, it's like dad's tales because it's like, oh, I just did this because most of my dad did. And like, or that awful okay, well, joke about, wrong. that awful joke about <laughs> cook it this way, cook it that way, blah, 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 then throw it away and eat the plate, you know, those kind of jokes. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, you know, it's so boring. <laughs> yeah. So boring. But yeah, there's so much folk wisdom, and uh, wisdom is in full quotes in that case, that just as wrong it's just flat out objectively wrong and you know i don't care if you do it it's not gonna there's no skin off my nose but i'm gonna tell you that you will have a better experience if you don't do x y or z and so that's part of what i do we'll get right back to the show in a moment but first i wanted to tell you about paleo valley's 100 grass-fed beef sticks I recently received a package in the mail with all of their flavors. By the way, I like them all pretty equally, though I'm partial to the original flavor. Anyway, they were interested in sponsoring the show and I wanted to test out their products first. Now, I already knew the benefits of grass-fed, grass-finished meats with their substantially higher content of omega-3 fatty acids, conjugated linolenic acid, and glutathione, but I hadn't had many meat snacks that I really liked. Well, I still haven't, and that's because my wife likes them so much that she's gotten to most of them before I could. Seriously though, these meat sticks are excellent and perfect for your backpack when you're traveling or just need a high protein, low carb snack. If you're doing the paleo, keto, or carnivore diet, or you just want a quality meat source on the go, visit paleovalley.com forward slash wildfed. Again, that's paleovalley.com forward slash wildfed. That'll get you 15% off your order in addition to the bulk discounts they offer there on the site. Again, go to paleovalley.com forward slash wildfed and your 15% will automatically be applied at checkout. Again, paleovalley.com forward slash wildfed. There are several flavors to choose from and they're all excellent. These are not like the spam tasting meat sticks from that highly processed brand at the health food store. You know who I'm talking about. These taste more like a summer sausage made love to a Slim Jim. And as I mentioned, they're Avani approved too. Trust me, she's picky. Again, go to paleovalley.com forward slash wildfed and get 15% off your order. These are fantastic in your cupboard, your freezer, your backpack, your car, anywhere you need a high quality meat or protein source on the go. Now, back to the show. One of the things I wanted to ask you about is, you you brought it up before, you, you we were talking about new people coming in to the lifestyle and 
you were saying, well, it's really hard and it's hard. It's a lot of work. I mean, it's, it's a lot of getting up really early. It's a, it's more processing than it is actually doing the activity most of the time. Um, then there's the cooking, the preservation. It's a lot. It's, I guess I could say it's inconvenient compared to what people are used to when it comes to food. Um, and I want to ask you this question in two different timelines. What was driving you in the beginning? So you, we went back to mid 2000s we were talking about, and you were saying it was sort of like um, for your mental health at the time. But to do all of that stuff, like what was driving you into nature? Um, was it cooking? Was it time outdoors? Was it the pursuit? Like what, what drove you then? And what's driving you today? Because I know a lot about, you know, after a decade of, of running my business, my passions sort of shift and change over time when you turn a thing that you love into your job. So I want to ask about now that this is like a full-time job for you, um, how are you relating to it today and what's driving you now? And have you had to develop new hobbies that aren't your work? So the last one first, no. Um, two, what was driving me at the beginning I lived in a, I, I, I mean, I still have them in my closet right now. And fortunately, knock on wood, I can still fit them. I have a bunch of custom suits with, you know, French cuffs and all that kind of stuff. Cause that was what I wore to work. And yeah, I know you, you think most newspaper reporters dress like crap, but I, I was like, I thought you were the poor man's reporter. What happened? You're wearing cufflinks. And no, I mean, when you cover the Capitol, you need to look the yeah. people treat you like crap if you don't dress right. So I did. So, so that I lived in a very, <laughs> I don't know, human world, a, a world that did not have a lot of nature to it. So right. getting into nature for all of those reasons you mentioned, you know, just to be in it, um, the pursuit of, of something good to eat is another thing. And, and just to solitude and, and physical work as well, because my job did not involve any physical work. I, I mean, flash forward, I mean, I've, I've gone back to commercial fishing. And which, you know, there's no more physical work than that. I saw so, that in your bio on your Instagram and I was, I was like, really? What is he mean in the past or now? So that's, what are you fishing for? Salmon in Alaska. <laughs> no kidding. It's not deadly as cat stuff, but it's, no, you know, it's, yeah, it's, well, of course. Uh, but what, you know, what, how much of your year is that? Just a few weeks a year. That's amazing, man. I really like that. I did last year. It was two, last year was pretty much two months, but, um, but yeah, it's just, it's, I did what, it. What species of salmon? All of them. Um, so I did it at first because I had done a little commercial fishing as a young man and I loved it and I still love it and I love it to this day. And then I got, and I did it, I got a little taste of it in 2016 and 2017. And then in 2018, um, I got bacterial pneumonia that was antibiotic resistant and it was wow. a very difficult period. And at the time, the captain of the boat was like, Hey man, I need, I need a guy in August. And like, I don't know if I could do it. You know, I'd, I was so super sick and you know, that, all that kind of stuff. And I ended up doing it just to see if I could do it. And I could. So, and I loved it so much that I came back last year and did it much longer. And what kind of, what kind of operation is it? A gillnet. It's a gillnet mm -hmm. boat. Um, and the operation is called Taku River Reds. And it's uh, the reason why I really enjoyed it. It's it's based out of Juno, is because it's super high end fishing. And it's just me and the captain on the boat. And every fish is uh, gutted, gilled, and bled, and then iced. Boom, Beautiful. boom, 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 boom. Beautiful. So it's if you've ever heard of Copper River. Couple yeah. river salmon. It's the exact I'm, same process. I'm reading Kurlansky's new book right now, um, which I think is just called Salmon. He's contrasting, you know, these um, beat 'em up fisheries against these sort of premier fisheries um, quite a bit in that. Oh, book, here's so. a great example. So you know, you got Bristol Bristol Bay sockeyes. It's the biggest sockeye run on the planet. Well, they catch their fish in fifty times, hundred times as many fish as we do. This is why you can get sockeye at Costco because they're in giant, giant giant nets and they all get squashed together and they're they're sold in the round there is no fish that's on the round well okay that's not true there are no money fish that are in the round on our boat there is uh pink salmon we do not gut and gill because we sell them to the bulk market and most chum salmon 
we will sell to the bulk market. But a nice chum salmon, we will bleed because a nice chum salmon is a wonderful fish. Yeah. Um, so the high end nature of it really attracted, it's very, very high quality food. And, you know, yeah, it's hard work. And I may not go back as, you know, and do it much this year, but it's like, I needed to know that I could still do it at, at, at my rapidly advancing age. And <laughs> what year were you born? I was born, born in 1970. Okay. Um, so, and I could, and I've sort of, I've done that. And so that, that may answer part of your question about new hobbies. Um, it's still not, still in the same bailiwick as what I've been doing this whole time. But the, if, if embedded in your question is how do I keep it fresh after 13 years is that there will never be a day where there will not be some new aspect of wild food that I don't know that I just discovered about. Mm -hmm. And it might be a different region. It might be a different you know, ethnic group that I'm looking at, like I'm currently deeply in a, a, you know, so I know Canada pretty well and I know the United States real well and I don't know Mexico as well. So that's kind of my next thing. And I'm, and it's to the point where I'm actually working very hard to speak Spanish as much, as best I can, because you cannot understand Mexican food without speaking Spanish. And that the same holds true with any cuisine that does not speak English. Like, if you really think you know Italian food and you can't speak Italian, you're wrong. <laughs> you're just that. wrong. Because just a case in point. So if you, I have pretty much every Mexican cookbook written in the English language. There's maybe 20 of them. Maybe, maybe a few more. But there are scores and scores and scores of not only cookbooks in Spanish from Mexico, but even more valuable for what we're talking about there are a whole series of, you know, they're like ethnobotany recipe books from all the indigenous groups all over Mexico. Yeah. And it's absolute treasure troves. And I can, I can read a recipe in Spanish, but some of the, 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 the deeper text is a little bit tougher sledding for me right now. But man, the ingredients, and I mean, this is the thing, this is the thing, like, you know, Every year I grow some new herb or some new plant or whatever. Like I'm growing tree tomatoes for the first time this year. But that's the thing. It's like every year there's a new flavor and a new taste and a new combination and a new method and a new technique. You know, there's fermenting and, and different butchery and, and curing and drying and salting. And, and it just, it never ends and I don't want it to. And, and you know, 13 years going and it's I've not even remotely scratched the surface. So I think I will... On the day before I die, I'll be doing something new. So I'm I'm hearing from you that the piece that's driving you, because it's funny, you said if if embedded in your question is this, which is actually my next question. So, but embedded in my question, what I was trying to get to is like, what's the what ignites that flame in you to do this hard work to to pursue this? But I'm hearing that it's it's driven by the cuisine part of this. Does that feel fair? It's not like like. Like for some people, it's all about nature. They want to be barefoot and naked in the brook and, you know, that kind of thing. Or they want to be, they're driven by an interest in the past. So they want to be also tanning hides and, you know, napping flint to make arrowheads to hunt their deer. For you, what I'm hearing is like a lot about the cuisine and about regional cuisines and about understanding different flavors and things like that. Is that characterize it at all? I don't want to. Speak for sure. You. Like, so I, I was lucky enough to be on Mike Rose TV show once and he asked me if am I a hunter who cooks or a cook who hunts? I'm a cook who hunts. Okay. Um, you know, I'm, and, a, I'm a cook first and foremost. And then that kind of led me to the next thing, which is I notice um, I'm balancing two things because, you know, I'm making the show wild fed, which requires me to, to be constantly doing new things and learning about new things and going to new places. But I also have kind of developed my hunting and gathering calendar, so to speak. So I have something to do just about every day that I want to be in the field. Uh, I've kind of, you know, got a plant, mushroom, animal, fish, something I can pursue during each part of the year. So part of it is like trying to, part of me really likes to have this predictable year that I can keep going deep, like, like uh, keep going drilling deeper, deeper down on those not just those species, but also those pursuits. And then part of it is that I'm driven by novelty and I want to, so I have like a lot of places I want to go and things that I would like to do. I, I'm curious about your year, if it's spent more pursuing novel 
things so that you can keep growing? Uh, are you constantly casting a wider net or a deeper net, so to speak, in your year? Are, is a lot of your year revisiting places and species that you already work with or or you know, what percentage of it is is getting out to try to do new things? That's what's made this year very interesting. Um, with Miss Rona stopping all our plans, um, right. I am revisiting that which I started. So for years, the rhythm of my year was Northern California and intensely Northern California. And in this year, I'm really actually grateful to be forced to do this again. To, you know, I have bitter almonds in my backyard that are predate me. So, you know, I live off of Almond Avenue and there was a, an almond orchard before there were houses here. And some of these ancient almonds are around and their children are around too. So those almonds are perfectly edible when they're at the green almond stage. They're horrible when they're, when they're ripe because they're bitter almonds. But I have always been so busy that I've never really bothered with the green almonds because I've been doing other things. And I've had whole mushroom seasons where I've just not done it because I'm doing other things. And I've sometimes missed the shad or missed the striped bass in the Delta. And there's this, there's this, you know, rhythm every week or every month, there's something that you do in this part of the world. And I've done it all and quite a lot actually. So over the last bunch of years, I have cast that wider net and it's gotten wider and wider and wider and wider. And, you know, I, I, my childhood is all in the New York, New Jersey, New England area. So I know that stuff intimately because that's what I grew up with. So, but I didn't know the Gulf. So I have been exploring the Gulf for the last five years. I've been exploring the, the Mexican border on the U.S. side for a number of years. So the thing is the every new experience I get like that makes me smarter and it allows me to help someone else who has a question. So, I mean, ticky tack stuff like, oh, somebody wants to fillet a sheep's head. Well, you should know that sheeps have a real weird bone structure so that you can't get a real nice clean fillet out of it because they've got a real boxy um, gut cavity with strong, strong rib bones that protect it. So, you know, just little details like that, you know, like, uh, you know, you want to peel the skin off a of mahi before you even fillet it because it's just, it's just easier to do it that way. Every time I get a chance to go someplace new, I pick something up, pick something up and pick something up. And, and then when I get home, I'm able to share that knowledge with people who are looking for it. And it, and it makes, you know, many, many years ago, I thought I wanted to be at first a history teacher in high school. And then I realized that teaching um, a state run curriculum was not really for me. And then I thought I wanted to be a professor at a university. And then I realized that academics, uh, at least a great number of them have never actually been outside academia. And so they can be, well, not as the easiest people for me to deal with because I'm just a different personality. So my outlet for helping to teach other people interesting and cool things has been this. And so that's a huge thing of a huge piece of what drives me is that, hey, I look, I learned this pretty cool thing. You should find out. It's really awesome. Here it is. Mm -hmm. And then that just never really stops. When you go on vacation that isn't work, do you find yourself? Doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. So when you nope. plan a trip, is it around foods that you want to go harvest? Every single time. Even when I'm visiting my parents and, uh, you know, I mean, if I visit my mom, in when she lives in Rockport, I'm never not going to not forage or fish when I go there. Yeah. Well, I think that's really cool that you just shared that. Um, I would say I'm more like 90%. It's going to be focused on this stuff. And then those, that extra 10%, I end up like sneaking away and finding it. Um, but I wanted to ask you about for people who are somewhat new to all of this, who are listening and they are struggling with just finding that sort of inroad. Um, and they go to a new place, but they're not Hank Shaw. You know what I mean? They don't have, they haven't had a decade of building, uh, or longer than that, huh? You said since 2007, you've been doing your website. So they don't have, you know, a decade and a half of building this sort of reputation. So that opens a lot of doors is what I'm trying to get to. Um, 
how do how do you recommend to new folks uh, like how they go to a new place and they start to access some of these foods, or how do they find the people who get them out and show them these things? Because I find that a lot of people see this lifestyle and they go like, I really want to be involved in this, but I'm I'm struggling to find my way into it. You kind of have to be a little bit more specific. Let's just give me a for instance. For instance, you go down to Baja California because your friends want to surf and you're down there and you suddenly start to want to know more about, I don't know, uh, something you see there. I'm ca- kind of curious like how you, you're going to Mexico uh, or that's mm-hmm. your plan, right? Like how do you kind of figure out how to get involved in the wild food culture down there when you, how to find the right people to, because as you know, like sometimes you stumble onto something and that happens, you know, like a lot, you stumble onto something, especially with plants and mushrooms, like a lot less with animals, let's say, but you kind of stumble onto something and you figure it out. But other times you really kind of need to have somebody walk you through it, and show you how. And I'm kind of curious how you personally find those people. So let's not use Mexico as an example because there's a language barrier. Because the first thing I would say is learn Spanish. Um, <laughs> well said. So let's just say, let, here's a good example. I went to the Florida Keys for the first time right before lockdown. So in fact, I had to cut my, my trip short. So... I had never been to the Keys, and so what I did before I went to the Keys is I spent a few hours online looking up edible wild plants of South Florida. Because Florida is such a big place that the the flora changes dramatically once you get south of Tampa Bay, and it becomes semi tropical. And then when you get to the Keys, it's actually borderline actual tropical. So, you one advantage that I have over some people is I have a, a, it's an eidetic memory is what they call it. So like I, like I can remember that on page 127 of this book, I read that that's where the sea grapes were. So that, that's an advantage I have, but it's, but it's, it doesn't mean that you can't have it. You just, you write down, okay, this is what it looks for. And then, you know, you can just, if you, if you just know the names of things that might be there in terms of plants, when you know the name, then you can look it up because you have a computer in your pocket. And, you know, we, the, the sea grapes were everywhere when I was there. And that was a kind of a cool thing. And, How were they right? And, and they weren't, but that's fine. I, I figured out what the, ah, okay. So there, I've met this right. plant. Coconuts were everywhere, which is super cool. I'd never seen a coconut in, in real life before. And that was No that way. Was oh, you hadn't. Yeah. I'd okay. never seen a real life coconut. And I was like, so we Come were on. plotting on how to get, how to get these damn things off the tree. Um, but it, we had to leave before we. <laughs> the short ones. But, yeah. yeah, exactly. But you know, you look at the different fish that you could potentially catch. And and here's a here's a trick. If you are a fisherman and you want to, you know, experience the new, always fish the bottom. Forget about the pelagics because the pelagics are going to be the same pretty much wherever you go. Fish bottom fish. Mm-hmm. There will be just buckets of new and interesting fish. Oh, and uh, don't listen to anybody. Like, hey, you can't eat that fish. <laughs> They're lying. There's just there's, fish prejudice is one of the most insidious things of human knowledge. Like, every culture has this fish is good to eat and that fish is not for no good reason. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. So, I mean, those are two things to get in. Like, in terms of hunting, hunting's a bit harder. Hunting. My advice is always to to book a guide. You know, find a guide. And then in the conversation before you've actually booked the guide, say, hey, I'm new at this and I really want to use this as a learning experience. Are you, you know, I might be asking you lots of questions. I'm just interested in this environment. And you'll you'll get a good idea if, if that person's sort of gruff and grumpy. You're like, maybe you don't want to go with that guy. Yeah, maybe they don't have the heart of a teacher. That's an important thing to distinguish when you're learning is finding the people who actually want to teach and not assuming that everybody's a good teacher. Because some people are great at what Absolutely. they do. Absolutely. Yeah, it's funny you bring up the keys because that's where I started. Um, well, I had I had a business trip down there and was planning on doing. We were going to do a fishing trip together, and it was canceled to high winds. and uh, And I ended up getting into iguana hunting down there by walking into a tackle shop and saying, "Hey, I'm, I keep seeing iguanas. Does anybody hunt these?" And there was a guy in there who heard me and said, "I do." And then he, before I know it, you know, we're super close now and loaned me a snare down there, brought me to some spots. And that's how I got into iguana hunting down there. But the Keys is like a really unique opportunity for those of us who live in mainland USA. It's a very different environment. That was the thing that we saw. We couldn't get into it because we didn't have enough time because uh, there are so many really awesome recipes for iguana in, in Mexico. 
that I have because I can read Spanish. And I'm like, oh, we need to get some iguanas. And we, we were trying to figure out how to get these iguanas. And we, just, we couldn't figure it out in the short time that we were there. But we'll be back. Yeah, if you go back down, I keep my snare down there. Uh, and my buddy, actually, who I who I was talking about knows Holly from when he used to teach hunter safety up uh, in your area. So um, I think, uh, yeah, if you're ever down there again, uh, let me know and I'll, I'll turn you on to that. Because we've got the technique down. It's basically a, a fishing rod with no eyelets, um, at the end of which is a heavy swivel and um, a piece of monofilament that's turned into a a snare basically. So you got like a 10 foot snare and you just reach mm -hmm. out by the neck and man, they're awesome. Um, I want to ask you, cause you brought up about the sort of cantankerous hunter. Um, what do you think about, uh, the gap between, cause if you would ask me, what, what do I think are some of the contributions that you've made to this culture? One of them is this binding together of people who making foraging cool to hunters and making hunting cool to foragers. I feel like you have been a kind of a pioneer in that. Um, and I'm curious also, did you coin the term adult onset hunter? I did not. A guy named Tovar Cerulli coined that term. He's an academic from Vermont, and he wrote a book called The Mindful Carnivore. And to my knowledge, he invented that term. Ah, great. Um, I'm kind of glad to track it down. I always thought it was you. So what do you think about that sort of gap between hunting and foraging? Do you see it shrinking. Like for instance, I, I see that Ranella is talking about and writing a lot about morels these days. Like he's gotten Well he's not. Spencer Newhart Newhart is. Okay. So they're they're that community has become very excited about, you know, at least this mushroom genus. Um but you know there's there's just a big there's a big divide and it's almost it almost seems to fall a little bit almost like partisan. Like foraging's this kind of lefty thing and hunting's this kind of right thing or you know one's liberal one's conservative. It almost falls like that. I know that's not 100% accurate, but you kind of have these worlds that there's like a divide between them that's so vast it's about more than just plants and animals. So I'm curious how you see that and then have playing that unique role where you kind of knit things together. How has that been and where do you see that those cultures, do you see those cultures kind of finding each other in a bigger way? I mean, I see what you're saying about the partisan nature of it, but, and it's not, you're not wrong, but I think it's really overblown. I mean, I, I you just look at this forum that I run. Um, I think the, if you happen to be rural and conservative, you just pick plants. You don't call it foraging. You, you just, but you're doing it. It's, and this is the thing, this is that one of the things that I find highly, highly useful is to show new hunters who think that they're going to finally do it right because all the traditional hunters have not, to show those people that the people who have been hunting for seven generations yeah, you know what? They also eat their hearts. They also eat their livers. They may have one recipe that you may not like, but they're still eating it. They're not wasting it. And and, and vice versa, right? So you show that the, you know, the old guys that the newcomers are not, you know, hippy dippy whatever crystal worshipers. And it, you know, that bringing together is is vital. In fact, one of my favorite moments was um I was on book tour in 2016 for my venison book. And we had a, we had a, this big event and we had long tables and I'm looking in the parking lot and I kid you not, there is a dually with an NRA sticker parked exactly next to a <laughs> Prius with a coexist sticker. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I don't know if they sat next to each other at the long table, but they might've. And, mm. and so here's the thing, right? So when you get down to it and this is what's great about the website and all the things that, you know, the things I try to do is that I don't care where you are in the political spectrum. You can come together over the desire and the knowledge, the desire for for good, solid knowledge about wild foods. And I'm finding that there are tons and tons of you know conservative people who are inherently pick dewberries in the South, or inherently pick morels, or fiddleheads, or ramps, or or you name it. There's usually a, a smaller section of what they pick because it's very traditional based. So this is. It, it's part of their family's DNA and there may only be a half a dozen plants in it, but they're there. So the, where you see the kind of further to the, you know, it's, I guess it's further to the left, but not really. Cause I know I, as soon as I say that, I can think of a bunch of examples of, of not, but the people who are 
maybe picking wild plants for more than just that traditional thing that's part of the rhythm of their year, that is a different set of person. Mm-hmm. Because you know that's a that's it's just a different person, and it doesn't. It's I think it's uh, wrong to put politics into there because it's 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 an imperfect correlation. Yeah, I I, I agree. I'm. It's not a perfect, cor- but man, it's actually it's it holds true a lot of the like, especially if somebody self identifies as a forager. You know what Less I mean? Less so they, though, and, because you know they they tend to they tend to also be hunters as well. Yeah. Here we have a lot. At of least in the West. Out. Out here in the East, we've got the people who, you know, they traditionally, they grew up hunting, you know, they grew up fishing and there's about five or six plants that are real traditional to work with here. You know, our ostrich fern fiddleheads, uh, our blueberries, you know, et cetera, et cetera. We've, we've got a handful of them, but you know, when you start getting into more obscure plants or finding species that people haven't worked with for a while, it's like less common in the hunter space. Um, and just like, you know, conversely, there's been a lot of foragers who I've met and gently coaxed into, I mean, a lot of them are vegetarians. You know, I meet a lot of, you must meet a lot of vegetarian and vegan Mm -hmm. foragers, right? So there's sort of like, maybe politics isn't the right way to do it, but there's these kind of two different worldviews that seem like they merge sometimes, but if they're not careful, they, they won't, if they don't carefully look, they won't find each other sometimes. Like, have you ever, you know what I mean? Like with some people who they're really into wild food, but it hasn't occurred to them before that they could hunt. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I know some people like that, but it's less so. I I, I knew more of them in 2010. Yeah, so that's what that's another question I have is like in these years that you've been doing this work, how have you seen the space change? Because like you mentioned before, I mean, there was a lot less voices. Um, how have you seen it change, and where do you see it going over the next you know decade? I'm seeing this merging that we're talking about. I'm seeing way more people pick up all three legs of the stool. Yeah. And, uh, I think that's a good thing because it, it, from a, just from a cook's perspective, you're seeing people really do good work with their entire regional palate. You know, you see guys like Alan Burgo in, in, uh, Minnesota and the elevated wild guys in the DC area, you know, they're people who are really doing great work. Um, Pascal Baudar in LA, he doesn't hunt, so he's he's still he's still got some gaps. But his stuff with fermentation and plants is amazing. Um, you're seeing people who are picked up all three legs of the stool, you know, take up do things that I don't have time to do, and and part of me is is like meh, but the rest of it is like, whoa, that's really cool. And and so it's success is not a zero sum game, and. It's a shame that some people in this industry do think it is, but but where do I see it going? Um, I just see a continuation of this. I think you are going to see this kind of work done um, to advanced American cuisine, you know, yeah. and, and, a, and a, really a small a kind of because Mexico's doing it. Well, the whole world's doing it, really, to be honest. And it's just you know you see the European pioneers. Like Rene Redzepe and Magnus Nilsson, and and um, there's a Frenchman whose name escapes me. Uh, so you're seeing that on the high end. I don't know what's going to happen in the real long term because the the world is becoming more urban, mm-hmm. and the biggest demographic changes are not good for wild food there will be more and more people with no connection to the wild going forward. And if you have no connection to it, here's a good example. How many of you listening to this can walk through your neighborhood and name all the plants that live in it? Chances are not many. And if you don't have a name for something, it has no power. It doesn't really exist. It can go away. And writ large, you're getting more and more people for whom it's just a green thing. I don't know what it is. Oh, it's gone? Oh, didn't affect my life. So that's troubling. And that's not, that's going to happen. And I don't know when it's going to happen, but this is, a, this is an issue. The, the, the urbanization and the, the divorce from nature mm-hmm. is profound. And, you know, I feel if you 
look at what I do in a macro sense, sure, it's a finger in the dike, but the dike's going to break. When you look at hunting, for example, and you see the work of the meat eater, that whole um, that whole culture around not just Steve Ranella and his show and podcast, but kind of the whole culture that's developed around that with BHA and, and all of those folks. I in in you know, please jump in if you think I'm 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 wrong here, but while hunting has you know, obviously been with us into antiquity, modern hunting had kind of hit this point of, well, a very low point in its social acceptance and its public image. Um, And while there was some incredible folks still continuing to carry it forward and push it ahead, it hadn't really until recently kind of broken into the mainstream with a new look and a new feel. And I feel like what's happened as a result is that hunting into the next decade is very secure because of this facelift that it's just gotten and this all this PR and all of this you know connection to conservation and suddenly something that five years ago looked really unpalatable to a lot of people suddenly looks different and part of that's changing sentiments in the culture and part of that has to do with the back to the you know the idea of free range meats and all these kind of things but but a lot of that's been the work of, of a few people who've carried it into the mainstream in a sense. Um, first I'm, I, I want to know if you agree with that. And second, what do you, with foraging, do you see, because foraging doesn't really have that, uh, that I've seen and it doesn't have an existing legal structure that preserves it, um, or can demonstrate to the community at large why it's beneficial the way that hunting does. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? Cause foraging, I kind of worry that it's going to be restricted to private land with permission only at some point because so many people will become involved and there's really no, you know, there's no bag limit. There's no, you know, and, and unlike game, which is owned collectively in trust, plants are owned by the landowner technically in a legal sense. So, you know, do you see foraging kind of slipping faster than hunting? Or I know it's got a lot of popularity right now. So where do you see that headed? Well, there are bag limits in some places. So in most of the West, there are specifically on mushrooms, there are significant bag limits. Uh, if I find a what we call a commercial burn out here in the West where I could put some weight in my back, I need to go to a ranger station and pay for the commercial permit. Because if I'm if a ranger finds me with 25 pounds of morels and I don't have that permit, I'm getting popped. Okay. And rightly so. Um, you also need a permit to uh, collect pine nuts in bulk. You know, you can, there are, I can't remember what the bag limit is, but it's X number of pounds of cones or, or nuts that you're allowed. And so do I see more of that showing up? Sure I do. And, and I actually, I support it a lot, especially on public ground, mm. because there are a lot of humans and, you know, you have places that are become known for X or Y or Z and they can be disturbed in a negative way. I mean, if there's too many people in the woods looking for X, Y, or Z, it's even if they don't all find X, Y, or Z, there's too many people in the woods. And it's in the, the woods. I mean, you know this. I mean, whenever you walk in the woods, you're, you're a rock in a pond and you're creating these great ripples. Now imagine, if you will, uh, a, a big giant square and the big giant square is the woods and there's one person walking through the woods. Well, that's one set of ripples that's going through that big giant square. Well, now imagine that there's 10 people and all those ripples are going to, are going to meet each other. And so the whole forest will be disrupted. And anybody who's hunted in a forest knows that you have to sit down at the base of a tree for eh, maybe 20 minutes to a half an hour, not really moving for those ripples to go away. And then the forest will be back to normal because it'll forget about you. Well, now when you have that many people walking through a public area or even a private area, but it's, you know, again, we have private property rights here in this country and that's, that's a different story. But if you have them all walking through the same woods, that woods is disrupted in ways that you cannot see. So, yeah, I do think that there should be some kind of, of limit. I also think there should be a heavy limit on commercialization of foraging mm-hmm. because if I have a spot on public ground, which I do for wild onions, we don't have ramps in the West, but I've got a, a number of wild onion spots. It is in my best interest to not eat my seed corn 
because I want to go every year to this spot and pick, you know, some onions. But if I'm Joey, Joey Boombots, right? And I just like, oh yeah, I'm getting paid 15 bucks a pound for these wild onions. So I'm going to dig as many as I can. And I'm not going to care. I don't have a, you know, and it's just, it's, you know, people will argue on the other side. Well, then you have even more uh, incentive to not eat your seed corn because you're making a living off it. Well, yes. And I know a number of foragers who are very responsible at that doing, you know, that sort of sustainable stuff. Connie Green in California is one of them. And Mike Joswick in Wisconsin is another one where like they're very responsible at that, that for that precise reason. But, and you mentioned ostrich ferns before, that particular one is extremely sensitive to overharvesting. I saw just the other day, some guy posted on Facebook, he had dug up a bunch of ostrich fern fiddleheads. I'm like, you moron, you don't dig that thing. You cut three three fiddleheads off the thing and then you move because otherwise you kill the fern. And so the commercialization of wild foods is extremely troublesome. I don't not I don't have all the answers. And I think there something will eventually have to happen because um the tragedy of the commons is real. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I would rather see a lot of, I would rather see it regulated like hunting than see, you know, public land start, you know, them to start to say like, it's not allowed at all. Um, I think that we need to bring it into this, our legal structure. It's just, we bring everything into our legal structure. And at this point I, I do get concerned about that. And I agree on the commercial foraging side. I see, you know, every year when we go to forage fiddleheads, it's like, you just see, they just, it's like they took a lawnmower through there and just gotten everything. So, um, tell us about the future for you. What can we expect from you in the future? Um, where are you wanting to take things personally? And, um, you know, how do you see your career, um, you know, changing and shaping over the, over the next decade? Well, I can't think that far. I basically look at the six inches in front of my face, but, um, you know, normally, you know, what I, what do I have going on coming forward uh well number one is a fish and seafood cookbook and that comes out in a year a little less than a year but spring 2021 so it'll be the hardest book i i will have written because i have the most experience with it and yeah. that i'm excited i'm in the middle of writing it now and it's been exciting because i'm really kind of viewing this book as a codex of working with all kinds of fish and seafood freshwater and salt and, and it has to be as useful to you in Maine as it is to me in California, as it is to the to my Captain Tyson in Alaska and my friend Joe in, in Florida. So doing looking at fish in a brand new way um, is difficult. And, uh, and it's been some tough sledding in terms of being able to to write this piece that it, to make this book as useful for everybody. And, and, but that's been exciting. So that's the next thing that's worth that, uh, that's coming up. Um, do you have a, I'm, I don't, of course you're not going to tell us here, but do you have a title so far that fits in with your existing branding for your book titles? I don't, and I'm not entirely sure I'm going to. Okay. Um, I'm, I, it's, it's a coin flip whether I do a triplet name uh, uh, for this or not. Um, and I can tell you the book after that will definitely not be that because Holly and I have teamed up for a book of essays about hunting. Oh, wow. And it'll be a first non cookbook. And it's, it's a, you know, cause Holly and I, think heavily about this stuff and we deal with a lot of ethics and hunting and and just experiential stuff about this pursuit of ours and that book we're planning also in 2021 we're planning that one out for for hunting season in 2021 Great. so we've got a lot in the fire right now was it difficult also um i want to kind of let you finish what you're saying before but um i hear sometimes it can be difficult to get a uh seafood book to market um compared to other cookbooks did you find that or did your existing clout with your publisher help or i publish my books oh you do you self-publish them yep oh yep. so um i formed h and h books in 2016 based off a kickstarter that allowed buck buck moose to happen cool and the support from the readers was so amazing. Like it's still like, it's gotta be one of the high water marks of my, my life really is that we wanted to raise about $37,000 to, to get the book published. We raised 109. Wow. wow. And like, I was playing like, 
Biggie Smalls for like the whole month. It was just so amazing. <laughs> I can hear the smile in your voice when you when you say yeah, it. Yeah, and it was just amazing. And it was like, yes, not only are we going to be able to make this book, we're going to make this book amazing. And we did. And and then that book did so well that it enabled me to to publish Pheasant Quail Cottontail in 2018, which is all small game and and birds. And then it's going to you know the the success of those two books is just it's been this snowball that's allowing me to do the the essay book and allowing me to do the fish and seafood book and and you're right you're not wrong like like fish books are very difficult to bring to market i mean there's been you know four or five people barton siever another mainer he's he's one of the the few who's been able to do it and you know but Ain't no thing now. I can't. <laughs> the, this by by creating an actual publishing company to create actual real world class cookbooks, um, it's been liberating. Oh, that's great. And then, any other irons in the fire for you? Any other thoughts about the future? What it looks like? Well, uh, I think l- medium term future. I uh, look to Mexico. So, if you follow Hunter Angler Gardner Cook, you see that I do a lot of Latin American and Mexican recipes to begin with. Um, I'm in, I'm in year two of intense studying of Mex- of, uh, Mexican culture and Spanish. And at some point you will see a Mexico cookbook from me. Um, but this is the thing, like I, whenever I write a book, I want to be able to stand up in front of a, a crowd and have them ask me anything. And, and then if I don't know the answer, I know where to find it. So for a for me now this isn't true for everybody but for me for me to be comfortable with it i have to have that be able to have that interview in spanish so if i'm in mexico city and i have this book out and i'm being interviewed in spanish i have to be capable enough to to answer that because for you know a a wero from new jersey to write a mexican cookbook I better damn well know my shit. You gotta be legit. And, you gotta be. You know, and 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 even then, I'll get criticism, but that's fine. But if I can answer that criticism in Spanish, then I'm gonna I'm gonna at least feel that I have done my due diligence. And the uh, last question, man, how do you feel? You know, are you optimistic or pessimistic when you look at um, the human relationship to wild places and wild spaces? Do you do you sort of look out, you know, and see? I mean, there's you could you can obviously go both ways, right? It's like in some ways it's like, wow, this thing is being, we're just mowing through the ecosystem. And then you can also look at, there's a lot of bright points and it seems like people are waking up to a lot of things, although gradually. Um, what are your thoughts long-term about the human relationship with wild nature? I kind of mentioned it before. And I think, I think short-term we're okay, but I think, I, I suspect the, our relationship with the wild world will be pretty minimal by the time I'm an old man. Makes what you do so important. You're writing the, writing the museum, uh, the books for the museum then, or the wild foragers. Yeah, I mean, I hope not. I hope I'm wrong. Yeah. But I don't know, man. If you look at big, broad brushstrokes, mm-hmm. you know, 21, 20, I don't know. Yeah, Unless something dr- drastic changes, you yeah. know. I agree. Yeah, we're we're not on the right trajectory here. Um, t- <laughs> tell folks about uh, where they get your books. Like where they where do you like them to get your books? Um, and then all your other media and stuff, and where people can can find you. So I'm most active in three places. Um, my website is huntgathercook.com. Uh, it is Hunter Angler Gardner Cook, and that is a place where you can buy my last two books signed. Uh, pheasant quail cottontail, which covers upland game and, and small game, and then buck buck moose, which covers all things venison. You can get those through my website, and they're signed. So that would be a, that's kind of a cool thing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but of course, they're available wherever books are sold. So you can get them on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or your local bookstore. Um, I'm also very very active uh, on Instagram, where I'm hunt gather cook, and I am very active on a Facebook group called the Hunt Gather Cook group. Now it's a private group and you have to answer some questions to get in, but just say you heard me on this podcast and I will let you in. So those are really the places where I'm at more or less every day. Uh, the website is the core of what I do. And, and then you know I've got four books out, one on ducks, one on venison, one on upland. And then my first book is, has a little bit of everything. And that's, that's also called Hunt Gather Cook. Um, I just want to 
close out by saying, you know, when we started this podcast uh, in episode one, I kind of went through a list of people who had influenced me and made me want to do this show. And uh, you were really high on that list. And I just want to say thank you for all the work that you do and the influence that you've had on so many people. I just think uh, your work's incredible and it's very much appreciated. I really appreciate that. It makes <laughs> it, 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 it. This isn't all sunshine and light what I do. And it's nice to hear that. <laughs> well, well uh, hopefully we'll get to connect in person soon. Thanks so much, Hank. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening to the Wild Fed Podcast. You can help us grow the show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out the Wild Fed video show and store. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.